So to continue our set of interviews with people who might have some interesting ideas about where astronomy is going, we're very pleased to welcome back my colleague Charlie Lineweaver, who we saw earlier in the entropy section of this course. So Charlie, uh, what do you think has been the biggest scientific or astronomical breakthrough since you've been a professional scientist? Well, for me, that has to be the, the discovery that we made in 1992 of fluctuations in the microwave background. Uh, I, why, I mean, it's a personal that, you know, my supervisor got the Nobel Prize for discovering these fluctuations, but I think it, uh, it just opens up the whole idea of we now have a scientific picture. Pr uh, cosmology has turned into precision cosmology, and that means that we used to wave our hands and say the universe is about 10 to 20 billion years old, and now we say it's 13.78 billion years old, and we're working on the next digit. That's what, what I mean by precision cosmology. So that means that our whole vision of how we got here and where we're going and where we've come from, that has got a lot more scientific input into that story. It's not just, uh, you know, uh, retired engineers you know, pontificating. We really have a lot of good evidence and we're getting more every day. So that, that the exciting picture for me is, you know, scientific revolutions come when you change the vision of who you are. For example, the Copernican revolution, why was that so important just to put the sun, hey, we're all going around the sun. Well, that's because it took the earth, our chosen place, our place that we love so much and put it over here. And that changed we, who we thought we were. And I think any good scientific revolution does that. And for example, Freud did that, or Darwin did that. He says, hey, we're a special animal. And he said, well, we're an animal. And that, I, that type of changing who you are is the, probably the most important part of science, I think, and probably the reason for science. And I think the, the, what we're doing now is understanding how we got here. And when we find, I think the next biggest discovery will be the detection of life in the universe because we're not quite sure what life is and maybe there'll be aliens that'll come and kill us instantly or maybe we'll, they'll help us fill out an application to the galactic uh, club and we'll all be like a giant UN in the galaxy or something weirder, weirder, weirder. And that I think will be the, and that's not too far off because in the next 10 or 20 years, we will have instruments that will be able to sense, sniff out the atmospheres in the infrared spectra to see if there are chemical gases out of chemical equilibrium that would be the telltale signs of life on the surfaces of those other rocky planets, which we now know are everywhere in the universe. So, talking about the next 10 or 20 years, you, you think there's a good chance we'll see so-called biomarkers, things that indicate that life is there. Um, that would be pretty exciting. How, how do you think that will change uh, the human's perception of ourselves? Well, I, I'm hoping that humans will be on this planet for a while. The people talk about the technological singularity in which our computers get smarter than we are and they start computing themselves and programming themselves. And then uh, I'm not sure what a human being will be after that. We'll, we'll get knocked off our pedestal as the most intelligent you know, homo sapiens, right? We'll have the you know, computer sapiens and we'll be some sub sapiens. Or, um, so that's, a, that'll, that's coming, it's on its way. So that's one big problem. But discovering life elsewhere, or you just said, oh, you just sniff out life, what will that mean? Well, I think it will start us on a long journey towards trying to define what life is in general. And uh, I don't think we know. We pretend we know, but we don't know. And we would like to know if there's you know, other beings out there who have intelligence who could colonize the galaxy and, and have figured out the, the physics and figured out the exact history of the Big Bang even before the Planck time or something. So that's if we find life, intelligent life, that'll be in, an incredible... Uh, undermining of our ego and maybe help us do something. I'm not quite sure what. But in any case, it'll revolutionize our idea of who we are. And that, I think, is an in incredible, mind-blowing thing that uh, is going to scare everybody, but it might provide some hope as well. We have to be optimistic. I mean, you suggested that we don't really understand what life is. So I did. I doesn't definitely. Doesn't that mean that if we find life in space, we might not even recognize That's it for right. what it is? I, I how are we going to even tell? Even in the next 20 years, That's we might see some strange on equilibrium chemistry. How can we tell if it's life? Right, exactly. That's a good, very excellent question. And uh, I wrote a chapter that says, we have not detected extraterrestrial life, or have we? 
And that is, if you redefine life as being a far from equilibrium, dissipative system, like we are, like hurricanes, like fires, then we've already detected life. Stars are life forms. But most people say, well, wait, that doesn't, have, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any DNA or something, or the information content is not there. And then you say, well, do you have to have information content inside yourself, or can you have your information content outside yourself? Right now, we're learning you're going to sequence your DNA completely, put it in a test tube, and say, hey, do you want a child? Okay, press a button. So therefore, your information is then exported, and and then your reproduction will be exported. And uh, well, you know, is that life? Uh, how far can you go along that path and still call it life? I don't know, but I think this dichotomy between life and non-life is a silly one that we have to get rid of if we want to really understand how we got here. But so far, we're stuck with it. And so that's why I feel uncomfortable by answering the question, how will you recognize life? You don't need to recognize life because in biology, whenever you go back in time, you are undoing the structure that you're trying to understand. If you, for example, if your eyeballs or your brain or whatever, we take your eyeballs and go back in time, they turn into things that, oh, they're, well, they're proto-eyeballs. You go back even further, they're proto-proto-eyeballs. And so the same thing with life. You take life, oh, we understand that. You go early, you say, wait a minute, is that life or is that just an autocatalytic reaction? Oh, is that an autocatalytic reaction or is that a semi-autocatalytic reaction? So you undo the concepts that you're using to ask the questions, and that's the most powerful form. Unlearning such things is the most powerful form of learning, I think, and that's what we're headed for. So this time scale of 10 or 20 years, you suggest we're pretty likely to discover biomarkers out there. Do you think we'd actually have any evidence of intelligent life? Or is that going to be much further out? Well, I, I've argued that the, the... Well, I have argued that we don't know... Well, I've said that human-like intelligence is a species-specific characteristic. That is... We look around us on Earth and say, oh, we're the only smart ones here. Let's, are we alone? When we ask the question, are we alone? We say, we are the homo sapiens. And alone means, are there any other uh, functionally equivalent homo sapiens out there with whom we could talk or they could build radio telescopes and rocket ships, etc.? And I think that uh, we, human-like intelligence is a species-specific characteristic, and therefore, we should not expect it elsewhere. Um, most people think, oh, it's really good if you're smart, and therefore it's a universal adaptation, and therefore we should expect it elsewhere. And I've argued strenuously against that because it's been tested on Earth. Those tests are called Australia, New Zealand, South America, Madagascar, in which you have a large continent in which landlocked creatures are evolving independently of each other, so you have multiple experiments. And when you ask the question, on these continents, is anything there evolving to fill this intelligence niche which we think is there? And the answer seems to be no. Uh, you go to Madagascar and say, oh, what, what evolved there during the 15 million years uh, it's been independent? Or in Australia. You know, what evolved in Australia during the 100 million years that was an independent experiment before humans arrived? And what is the most human-like thing or the most, you know, filling the intelligence niche? And the answer is nothing that we can identify. There's been no progress anywhere we can see towards being more human. And so I think it's kind of vain to, for us to think that our human-like intelligence is a convergent feature of evolution, and therefore we should expect human-like intelligence elsewhere. So looking further afield, um, if you go out to 100 years from now, so um, what, what do you think... Where do you think astronomy will be going in that time? Do you think on that time scale we'll have found something that we would accept as intelligent out there in space? Or is some other big No, no, no. I don't, I, I, like I said, I, I don't think we're going to find what we consider to be intelligent out there. I think we'll find something, and it'll be weird. It'll certainly be a far from equilibrium dissipative system and new, need to extract free energy from the universe just like we are doing. It's not going to violate the second law. But whether it will use what we consider to be human-like intelligence to, you know, make oil rigs and, you know, make little globes here and make television cameras, that I, I am very skeptical of that. Although most physicists disagree with me. Most physicists and astronomers think, hey, they're brains are so big that surely this is a universal adaptation, therefore we should expect physicists out there. And they think math is the language that should be used to communicate with these extraterrestrials. But I think the, we should take biology more seriously on Earth and what has happened here. And when we try to communicate to other species, for example, I think music is much more, or just touching is a more effective way to communicate across species than math or science. And that should tell us something. I'm not sure what, other than, other than uh, we shouldn't necessarily try to write equations and go beep, 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 use Morse code. You ever try Morse code with your dog? It's very, it doesn't work very well. But if you try, you know, petting it and feeding it, uh, music, they don't do well so well with music, but dolphins do well with music. All right, thank you very much. You're welcome.